Most are afraid of unknown depths, skirting shores thinking world flat. I'm with the island girls in celebration of new religion. Nobody led me or said this way. I sailed alone on makeshift raft with wind as companion. Fate for deliverance, confidence enough to assess new disposition. Seekers of lost paradise may seem fools to those who never sought the other worlds. Welcome to Momentary Zen with Zen Garcia. Visit www.fallenangels.tv. You're listening to Revolution Radio. The grand deception as Matrix is all-encompassing, broad-reaching, and veiled in the subtlety of finite machination. So covert in imposition, all those born into its nurturance are raised unknowingly, incarcerated by its deviant proposition. One was never even granted choice or opinion, which could assert choice or deviation from its programmed assimilation. Parents, grandparents, ensure loved ones foster compliance. Children make swift accord, resonating with sentence which postures them for role as good worker bee, soldier ant, ready to surrender life for benefit of queen and hive. So few of the far walkers can even grasp the dialectic fashioned as prison. Even those privileged with instruction and advantage are lost to resolution, which, connecting all dots, grants one insight into the revelation which unlocks all speculation, illuminating the secrets of life, effort, and being. Welcome, friends. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen. And tonight I'm going to be talking a little bit about the the grand deception and the matrix that we're all born into and the strange reality that we're dealing with as world. And my focus is going to be on ritual abuse and murder. And the reason I'm doing this this evening, uh, whereas I had wanted to focus on bringing what would be second in the series and a follow-up on last week's show, on the giants, the men of renown, uh, mythology, and the connections to the fallen angel, uh, the angel, fallen angels, and the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, which I'll still cover some of that material, but I'm going to delay focus on that particular topic and show. And in covering it in the way that I want to, for two weeks time and the reason I'm doing so is because next week I'm going to bring on as guest Kevin Annette uh, for those that don't know he is um, the ch uh, chief witness for the ITSCC the the individuals that are bringing lawsuit against the royals, the elites, Joseph Ratzinger and uh, the now current Pope um, Francis and they and even the Queen of England for ritualized murder, um, the slaughter of innocents, children, abuse that has taken place over decades to certain individuals and these individuals there's now eight or more that have come forward with eyewitness account as to the their own personal trauma torment under the hands of some of these individuals and some of their family members which have association to these 
um, these particular forces. And so that's why I wanted to change the current focus of the topic that we're going to be talking about this, um, this evening and focus on this so that I can prepare you for his coming and joining us next week. And so I'm going to post a link in the chat room to the website where you can find information on his work and also their attempts and efforts at bringing lawsuit and also in outing what we, you know, those of us that have looked into things like the topic of Franklin cover-up, uh, the abuse of children by priests and cardinals and bishops of the Catholic Church, at which I think just maybe a decade ago, there were a number of stories coming out left and right, um, making the mainstream news, speaking about this, the, the kind of terror that innocent children were forced to undergo at the hands of these priests, which were then protected by the Pope at the highest levels of the Catholic Church, and that the Vatican spent millions of dollars paying off victims, um, shutting down lawsuits, and trying to keep this information from destroying uh, the Catholic Church and in causing worshipers to abandon them as institutions. And so we're going to focus on that this evening. And as I said, we'll bring Kevin Annette on next week with us to join us for the next two hours. All right. Um, as far as the itccs.org, it's the International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State. And it says, our mandate, one, to lawfully prosecute those people and institutions responsible for the exploitation trafficking, torture, and murder of children, past and present, and number two, to stop these and other criminal actions by church and state, including by de-establishing those same institutions. Um, okay, and, and so for those that don't have access to the chat room, you can go to IT ccs.org and they've got a number of representatives from different countries there are updates um, news releases press releases talking about their efforts they are naming high level individuals as to you know as I made mention the current pope and the past pope, uh, Queen Elizabeth, other royal families um, all across Europe, and they're bringing eyewitness account, videotaped confession of individuals that have endured such atrocity. And, and so it's going to be absolutely fascinating show to, to have Kevin join us, and I feel really honored that he's gonna, going to come on with us at such uh, a quick time. And the, the court case will actually make it to, um, it begins in April and May. And so these are going to be interesting times as far as the testimonies that are coming out associated with this ritualized abuse. And for those that don't know, um, it's been linked, this particular 
topic, which we've heard about this from other Illuminati insiders that have come out and given confession as to the their own involvement in such activity, and that even as children they were forced to undergo ritual abuse and had either taken part in or been witness to the murder of children and that we've ha also had testimony from like the likes of John Todd, Kathy O'Brien, Carolyn Hamlet, uh, Arizona Wilder, Savali, different individuals. These are all Illuminati insiders that have come to uh, come to know their Lord and King and having accepted Christ as Savior Messiah have testified and given confession of their interaction and their participation as well as the things that they witnessed which decades ago seemed just too bizarre to be believed almost you know just completely fantastical and beyond belief. And I think that's one of the reasons, one of the things that the elites depend on is that the things which are spoken about in connection to their behavior just seems completely implausible. And how could such action and behavior have any justification or any you know, precedence as far as reality. And so for a long time, they've been able to get away with it. But now with the internet and with, um, you know, uh, the modern era of newspapers and global institutions and platforms, which can speak about this and, um, and that so many are now becoming empowered to talk about things instead of just keeping quiet and or you know committing suicide or because uh, a lot of them have done that as well. Um, but I'm also going to be speaking about the Franklin cover-up. And for those that don't know what the Franklin cover-up is. A Senator John DeCamp back in the early 80s, he was appointed by the Republican Party to go and speak to a group of children, kids and teenagers that were all speaking about and sharing testimony as to their involvement with uh, the Boys and Girls Club of Omaha. And, and how they, they talked about how they were flown around in private planes, taken to these um, political parties where they were given drugs and prostituted to high-level members of Congress and even to the president, George H.W. Bush at that time, and how they talked about that they were involved also in not just, you know, being pimped out and as, um, as sexual toys to all of these high-ranking political and entrepreneurial, industrial um, <clears throat> moguls, but that they were involved in... in satanic ritual abuse and murder and so those things I'll be speaking about as well and and Watcher Ruth says that they start with their own children and yeah and that's the bizarre thing about it is that they do not even honor the sanctity of their own children but abuse them from early on uh, Kathy O'Brien speaks about in her book, um, I can't remember the name of it, but you can certainly go to Amazon 
she's got two of them that she's written, uh, speaks about how her father had abused her sexually since she was a young child and that her pacifier was basically his his penis and i mean it's it's just horrific that these kind of things are are the kind of uh incidents that people would have to endure and be exposed to it, it's just it's it's beyond belief for those of us that are good hearted and just regular normal people who care about our family members, love our children, our mothers and fathers and you know have never been exposed to any kind of behavior in that way even though there is a lot of abuse uh, in familial relationships and that young girls especially but even young boys are targeted by family members for abuse but the the kind of abuse we're talking about is instituted these satanic illuminati families uh they are generational in their organization of abuse and in their efforts to create schizoid type children and to to scatter them in personality and mindset and it's just again it's beyond beyond bizarre to us because we just can't understand it but this is the kind of stuff that the elites the seed of cain these Illuminati families are incorporating into the raising of their ch children. Yeah, it, it's that. It, this is what they call nurturance, and it's normal for them. And that they even uh, offer their children to be given unto sacrifice in order for them for them to get a, a step ahead or a, a leg up as far as uh, wealth or reputation or status or position. I mean, again, it, it is, it's beyond bizarre. Um, and so when we come back from break, I'm going to share some of, some of the stories from the Franklin cover-up first. Because you have to remember that this, what we're going to be talking about was from the late 80s. And it was also one of the initial naming uh, as far as the uh, accusation of Catholic priests and their involvement in the ritualized abuse of children. And also to the cover-up by these different popes um, in, in paying off victims and their families. So to kind of squash the story and to keep it, to try to keep a lid on. But it was so prevalent and, and occurring so often in so many places, which again is is just... Um, it's just verification that the Catholic Church is encouraging and also instituting such behavior among their priests and that the cover-up is their way of showing to their those that are following in their you know, in their protocol, uh, that they would be protected. But it got so outrageous, and finally the public did speak out in a way that demanded some accountability. And so, um, 
we will start start with that when we come back. But I'm going to go ahead and read about the lawsuit just to give you an idea of what Kevin Annette is involved in. It says this. In the matter of the people versus Bergoglio, Pashan, Welby, and others charged with global child trafficking and ritual murder, the court, the court adjourns for two weeks after the first round. In the prosecutor's case, discloses the startling testimony of eight witnesses. Also, when we come back, I'm going to post links to some of the video of these eyewitness testimony. It really is just heartbreaking. And the individuals that have come out and have shared um, their information, the, you can tell that they have been traumatized their whole lives. I mean, just imagine that you're a child and from the time that you can even recall having memory uh, and and are able to even fathom your surroundings and your environment that all you can remember is being um, abused physically, sexually, verbally, emotionally by all the members of your family that you would expect would love you and want to protect you and to keep you from such harm. Your mother, your father, grandfather, um, uncles, aunts, uh, brothers, sisters. I mean, it's just, wh who do you turn to? And, and how do these children even survive? I mean, how do they not just at first opportunity uh, kill themselves and, and, you know, remove themselves from such a situation. It's just, it's, it's absolutely horrific. All right. Two separate witnesses described their alleged rape and ritual torture by chief defendants, Jorge Bergoglio, alias Pope Francis in 2009 and 2010. The chief prosecutor establishes a link between the British, Dutch, and Belgian royal families and the disappearances and killing of Mohawk children at the Church of England's Brantford Indian Residential School in Canada. Also, let me make mention that um, since this particular court case has come forward and these allegations have been brought into public disclosure that m mass ritual grave sites have been found on the grounds of this one particular um, Brantford Indian Residential School, as well as many other where such abuse has taken place. Jesuit records are introduced as evidence detailing the so-called magisterial privilege decreeing papal involvement in, quote, the ninth circle ritual murder of newborn children. The same records identify Joseph Ratzinger as a member of the Knights of Darkness SS sacrificial cult during World War II. ITC... CS Field Secretary Kevin Annette, who is the individual that will be joining us next week, is scheduled to testify before the court during its second round of sessions in early May to corroborate witnesses' testimonies from his own work and experience. A prominent Vatican official initiates back channel communication with the court and offers key evidence as magistrates consider extending closed court sessions during May. The court and its affiliates will issue an Easter proclamation this Sunday, April 20th, 
and endorsed public action at the Vatican Catholic churches across the world. Reverend Kevin Annette will lead a public ceremony of exorcism and replacement at a prominent Catholic cathedral on that day. Following eight days of court procedure and the commencement of the citizen prosecutor's case against the three chief defendants, the first common law adjudication of evidence concerning global child trafficking has adjourned for two weeks until 10 a.m. GMT on Monday, May 5th, 2014. Commencing on Tuesday, April 8th, after an opening court session, the day before the case by the Citizen Prosecutor's Office presented evidence directly linking all three chief defendants with the planning and execution of child trafficking networks within the Roman Catholic and Anglican churches and with the practice and concealment of the ritual rape, torture, and killing of children. Along with considerable documentation, the prosecutor introduced notarized affidavit statements from eight eyewitnesses to these crimes, including videotaped interviews with two adolescent women who claimed to have been tortured and raped by a chief defendant, Jorge Bergoglio, Pope Francis, during the spring of 2009 and 2010 at horrific cult functions connected to the Ninth Circle Child Sacrifice Network. Survivors of these rituals describe newborn babies being chopped to pieces on stone altars, and their remains were then consumed by the participants, described the chief prosecutor to the court. The survivors during the 1960s period were forced to rape and mutilate other children and then cut their throats with ceremonial daggers. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody. A um, couple comments from the chat room. Uh, Lou says uh, it is called the Detroit case, D-E-T-R-O-U-X. Now, I'm not sure um, if this is, you know, one of those satanic ritual abuse cases, but I do have a whole list of cases where satanic abuse has been involved. Even the John Bonet Ramsey case, uh, is one of those that was covered up that has connections to what we're talking about. Um, Watcher Roo says the control comes from the fracturing of the mind for self-preservation. The most easily controlled emerging personality is abused and further traumatized as they are programmed. And the this particular technique that Watcher Ruth is speaking about is called the um, part of the Monarch program, and that it, it has been it has been perfected by you know what was the the doctor from the Nazi uh, Joseph Mengele, and that he was involved even in the the in in doing this mind control and these kind of torture, uh, ritual abuse to individuals such as Arizona Wilder and uh, I believe to Kathy O'Brien. And uh, that many of these individuals have been put through such ritual abuse. And so, uh, and we're going to read some testimonies now I'm going to share, and if anybody has any further information, certainly share it in the chat room, and I'll, I'll get to it as soon as I can. But I, again, I wanted to m mention this book, The Franklin Cover-Up, and for those that have never read it, I am going to put a link in the chat room to where you could download a free PDF copy for yourself. And... It's absolutely fascinating information. And again, it's one of those that was on the forefront of the, you know, the connections to priests, uh, 
Catholic priests and also to uh, these um, what we think uh, of as programs that are you know foster uh, fostering programs for boys or girls, uh, which uh, again gets them these um, gets them involved. You know, some of the children are involved in clandestinely in in such abuse and are put through what we're talking about this evening. Um, and so we're going to see how far the rabbit hole goes, because just in what I read in the last part of the first segment with the 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 different eyewitness accounting and the accusations being levied against individuals such you know as the popes and um and also to some of the like the queen and these royal elitist families i mean it's just it, it it's beyond bizarre even like with what was talked about in this particular book um these accusations were levied against like George H. W. Bush and high level Republicans and uh, Democrats, people in uh, the houses of Congress and and also to, you know, industrialists, entrepreneurs, as far as uh, chief of police and judges and and how all of them got involved, even the FBI got involved in the cover up. And in turning eyewitnesses against um, against those that have testified uh, about such ritual abuse, like Troy Bonner, he was worried for. Uh, I believe they killed his brother, and then after that, he recanted his own testimony, and then testified against the others, and the jury was able to utilize his testimony to uh, throw out the others and also to convict them of perjury. And so, um, and like uh, there was a public, uh, a public defendant that was killed, him and his son were killed. His plane was blown up when he started to investigate these matters. I mean, so there's a lot of cover up uh, and has been for a very long time, and that's why it, you know, these stories still seem just absolutely new to the public when it's really it's old news and they've been covering it up for a very long time. All right, the first um, account that I'm going to be reading from is from a girl named Loretta, and she is talking to her doctors about the kinds of things that she was involved in, the occult activity. She was forced to be participation, to have participation of, upon. And this will give you, you know, again, this goes back to the, um, the book was written like in the early 80s. And so this involvement, this activity goes back even further. All right. It says, Loretta provided additional information on her previous involvement in cult activity, which included the witnessing of homicides of several young children and which also included references to Larry King, not the Larry King of CNN, but a Larry King who was a, uh, a black Republican that's sang during uh, some of the Republican conventions, and uh, he was a very prominent state Republican representative until he was indicted on charges of um, dis the disappearance of $40 million in connection to um, a bank collapse. Back at that time when there was a bunch of banks folding and that the money was embezzled in different activities. Um, and so, continuing, and others involved in the cult activities. 
August 19, 1988, the hospital notes indicated that Loretta was asked to give a chronological account of involvement in what is described as a devil worship cult and that Loretta agreed to do this. Loretta indicated that she didn't really know what was happening and that she became involved very gradually. She indicated that when she was approximately nine years old, she was going to the girls club in Omaha and that a guy named Ray would take her and four or five or other girls at the girls club out on outings. He took them to a building that according to Loretta looked like looked abandoned and asked the girls if they wanted to go in, which they all agreed to do. Loretta indicated that they sat and talked for a while and then Ray provided a joint and all of the individuals got high. She indicated this activity continued for about three or four weeks and then Ray took them to a party. Loretta indicated that at the party there were about ten men all in their mid-thirties and that initially they sat around and talked with the girls about their problems. Loretta indicated that all the people got wasted and that the men at the party made them sleep around and that the girls did not have a choice of who they slept with. All right, Loretta stayed away from the girl clubs after this for a few days, but then in order to get out of the house, she did begin going to the parties again and they lasted for another six months. On one occasion, she threatened to tell her mother that the men were having sex with her and that they knew she was only nine, but the men indicated that they would kill anyone who told about the activities. The men started talking, taking the girls to what the men described as power meetings. Loretta advised that she was 10 years old. She indicated that candles and other weird stuff were at the power meetings. According to Loretta, one of the individuals on one occasion told the girls that the room was going to spin for a while, and it did, and she realized later that it was drugs that the men had given them. Loretta advised that about eight months later, she was put through her first, her first test. Her and the other girls were taken to a building in Omaha where... She was locked in a room with a little girl, which she described as a Caucasian infant. At about midnight, Loretta indicated that the men came into the room, took the little girl away from her, and told her that she could achieve power by killing something that she really loved. Loretta described that they then cut the little girl's head off, stuck it on the wall, and made her sit in front of it. Loretta indicated that later she had to take the head off the wall and that the men held her down while they cut the eyes out of the little girl's head. They then left Loretta and the girl in the room locking the door. She was left in the locked room with the little girl for 24 hours and during this time she could hear another one of the girls screaming. She could hear the men whipping and beating the girl. Shortly after this the men came into the room and told Loretta that she had passed the test and then drove her a couple blocks from her house and let her out. Loretta indicated the next time that she saw the men, she had gone to a friend's house who was having a party, and the men showed up. Loretta identified two of the men as Larry King and a Mr. Finch, who Loretta indicated was a school principal. Additionally, she identified parties as Ace, King Horse, Jerry Lucifer, and Mike. After one such party, Loretta said another girl called OPD and reported that she was raped and tried to press charges. Other girls covered up the rape for the men. Loretta indicated that she again threatened to tell about the activities and the men said they would kill her or her mother. At another meeting, Loretta indicated devil worshiping was practiced and that another small boy was sacrificed. Loretta and the other girls were in the other room and she could hear the little boy screaming. She then indicated the child was fried and eaten by the girls. Loretta indicated she refused to take part in this so that the men beat her for two days. 
At additional meetings, Lorena indicated the men told her and the other girls that they must sacrifice for power and described three incidents where further sacrifices took place. The first, a one-year-old white female had her head taken off by a saw. The second, a four-year-old white male was hung on the wall and darts thrown at him. And the third, an Indian female, three or four years old, had several parts of her body cut off, after which it was ground and poured on the girls, and they also were made to drink the remains of the child. August 21, 1988. Loretta indicated the third fourth and fifth sacrifices took place during the spring of 1985 when she was 11 and that the parties that were at these sacrifices were Mr. Finch, King Horses, and the big guy she referred to earlier. Between the sacrifices, she indicated that the girls were tested to see if they would keep quiet and how much control the men had over them. Loretta indicated that the men would try to scare the girls by having them watch as animals were mutilated and also the men would threaten them by saying that instead of killing them that they would just cut off parts of bodies and torture the girls and make them suffer. Asked to provide details relative to the first sacrifice of the infant girl, Loretta indicated that at first she didn't cry. And after this, the men cut the eyes out of the girl. Loretta indicated that she freaked out with screaming and hitting the walls. She said the cult members were wearing what she described as clothes which had upside-down crosses on them and that the leader always wore a long black cape with gold rings shaped like a skeleton head. Loretta went into the Emanuel Hospital for the first time in November of 1985 and also was in Emmanuel in January of 1986 and March of 1986. And then her mother put her in the court system so that she could ultimately get her into Utah Haley, a school and residence for troubled girls. All right. That was the first. Now, there's many testimonies, and I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to actually go to the testimony of a woman who was um, a grandmother and she was involved in taking in kids from the foster care system for a long period of time. And what was surprising to her is that during her fostering, she kept receiving children that were sharing stories of their ritualized abuse and how they had been um, involved, forced to participate in this satanic ritual abuse. Now, before I read this woman's testimony, I just want to um, share some other information about the testimony of some of these children that were put into foster care. Um, that they talked about, you know, again, being you know, forced to, to be witness to the sacrifice of children or that they were involved, like their hands would be covered by these men's hands and that they would be forced to plunge a dagger into the heart of a child or to kill that child uh, in that kind of a way. And that there were also descriptions of how it was that the bodies were gotten rid of. That they would take a grinder and that, of course, they would cannibalize the, the, the meat of these children. And that they would also be involved in the drinking of blood of these children, but that they would take the bones and the teeth uh, of these individuals and that they would put them through these grinders and that they would grind them up until they were powder. And they did so because they said, if you didn't have a body, 
uh, there would be no charges or police investigation or anybody, you know, looking uh, to to see what crime had been committed. All right, let me check the chat room real quick. And again, I know this information just sounds completely horrific and beyond bizarre and absolutely beyond, you know, belief. Just completely um, lunatic fringe. But this is the kind of activity that is occurring and, again, that has been institutionalized by these satanic cults, these secret societies, these Freemasonic organizations, and that these elites are involved in, and that a lot of them are, you know, get involved in the foster care system in order that they can gain access to children uh, so that they can abuse them and also expose them to, you know, such programming. And that a lot of times these organizations at the top levels are controlled by those individuals that are involved in such ritual abuse. And so if anybody, you know, tries to uh, you know, tell of what they've experienced or what they've been forced to undergo, that, that their testimony is covered up. And they never get any kind of help. And so, you know, why even bother? And then they're punished in such way that, you know, they don't want to then um, trust anybody else with the abuse that they are undergoing. All right. This testimony that I'm about to read, which we might not make it through, um, but I'm going to try to, is the account of Kathleen Sorensen, a groundbreaking account of satanic activities in Nebraska coming from Kathleen Sorensen, the foster mother who took in Nellie and Kimberly Patterson after they fled from the Webbs. And the Webbs were a satanic family that uh, had abused these two girls. Uh, Mrs. Sorensen decided to speak out about what she had learned from children in her care. Together with her eldest foster daughter, a survivor of ritualistic abuse, she spoke at public forums around the state, gave radio and television interviews, and appeared on Geraldo Rivera's nationally televised special on Satanism. This is the report of Kathleen Sorensen gave on a Christian TV interview program aired in Nebraska in 1989, based on her experience with over 30 children who spent months or years in her home, and of which gave testimony about such ritualized and satanic occult activities and abuse. All right. We got involved and learned about this subject because uh, we'll be right back. We'll pick it up on the other side. All right, welcome back, everybody. I'm your host, Zen Garcia. This is Momentary Zen. And tonight we're covering ritual abuse, satanic occult activity among the elites of, and the, you know, like the priests, the, the Catholic Church, um, cardinals, bishops, and even the popes. And the reason that I'm speaking of this as topic this evening is because. Kevin Annette of the ITCCS, uh, the International Tribunal. Let me find a. No, I don't get it wrong. The International Tribunal into Crimes of Church and State, who is um, in his effort and his this uh, his organization's effort are bringing up cases of ritual abuse with eyewitness testimony against these individuals in criminal court and that this is taking place in um, Holland 
I believe. And we'll, if I have time, I'll read some of the you know, some of the news articles in relations to this particular topic. But I, I do want to finish two more eyewitness accounts. I'm going to try to get through them today. Um, just really quick, two uh, two items as far as Revolution Radio and our need of monetary support from individuals like yourself. Those of you that can, the disc, the data disc of all of your favorite host shows for an entire year, the whole archives for an entire year, uh, are now available on one disc that you can contact Nighthawk and order them. And that th in, in doing so, it will support not only the station, but also the your favorite host. And another way that you can support the network um, is by ordering the monthly archives and and just subscribing to them which is only 4.95 a month I, I myself participate in supporting the network in this way but again it, it gives you access to all of the mp3 downloads of all of the hosts that are found on both Studio A and Studio B, seven days a week, all hours of day and night. And that um, you can then listen to all of their shows and also introduce yourself <clears throat> excuse me, to some that you may never have had a chance to hear. And this way it gives you um, a broad range and a reach into all the other topics of discussion, all the other various perspectives done by all the many different hosts that are family and work together here at Revolution Radio and that use freedomslips.com as a platform for bringing you the real truth and covering heavy topics like what we're talking about this evening. Uh, Cortex says, thanks for bringing this out in the open, Zen. It's heart-wrenching, but these people need to be named and shamed and brought to justice so it doesn't happen again. And I absolutely uh, agree with you, Cortex. Uh, Noodle says it's a very heavy topic. Uh, it absolutely is. But again, it's one that we need to talk about and need to make people aware of. Um, and also, you know, especially children, because there's like 15 billion Catholics, and when they realize that their children are at risk and that this kind of abuse is instituted and protected at the highest levels of the Catholic Church, I mean, leave, come out of her, my people, is what the, the Bible says. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and read this testimony of Catherine Sorensen, and then uh, I want to share one more from the Franklin cover-up, and then I'll talk about the, the lawsuit again, give you details on that so that we can um, prepare for the show next week. We got involved and learned about this subject because we were foster parents and worked with a number of children. And several years back, several of the children began, after a period of time and building up trust, began to talk about some very bizarre events that had happened in their past. And they were frightening and very confusing. I really didn't know what to think. We went to the police and we went to social services and there was really nothing anyone could do. These children we worked with are now adopted in safe homes and probably would never have talked had they not felt able to trust the people they were living with. There are certain things that are in common in the children's stories. When we talk about devil worship, there are things that come up in every single story, such as candles. They all talk about sex. Sex is without a, do a doubt a part of every area of this. All sorts of perverted sex. 
That is what you will first hear about the sex, about the incest, and it is so hard to believe. But once we get that, we have learned that we can go on and ask and find out, and it will involve pornography. That is always part of it. Part of the reason is that they can use that to threaten the children. Quote, we have pictures. We will show the police if you talk, end quote. It makes the children feel that they are in great danger and they are all very frightened of the law. They talk about the garish makeup that the people in the group wear. They talk about singing that they didn't understand, obviously, that this chanting and that has come up in every one of these stories. And none of them call it chanting. There will be dancing most often that will involve sexual acts. There will always be a leader and they will be very frightened <clears throat> of the leader. These children from a very young age, and I am talking about children who came out of birth homes, the family they were born to, worship the devil. That's all I can share, and I don't pretend to be an expert. All I can tell you is what the children have told me. My husband and I say we know things we shouldn't know. That's true, and I thought very carefully before I agreed to do the program. Because we have heard so much and it is so ugly and so frightening that you hesitate to tell it to people. It's very heavy to know that I don't want people running around looking in their closets and not leading normal lives. You don't want to think you are giving people ideas. I don't want people to say if a child starts to talk about some of this, quote, they probably saw it on the show Kathleen did, end quote. But we're hearing more and more, and it is becoming very, very out in the open, and I think it's time for people to know that this is not fun and games. This is not something that we can laugh at or ignore. The children I have talked to have all had to murder before the age of two. That is something beyond anything I could comprehend. But in some way, whether with the help of an adult's hand over theirs, by having them practice, by getting them excited to be part of the adult scene, they do murder. And the evil thing that happens is that they really believe that they want to. They want to do what the older people are doing, and they are praised for that. And that becomes their goal, to be like the adults. There is a little part in them, that natural good, God-given part, which knows that it is wrong, but in a group that in the excitement of everything, they want to do that. They enjoy the sex. Children are capable of enjoying the sex. I didn't know that. Well, why would they fight against it? A child will eat a bag of candy if you give it to them. They will take part in these things willingly. When they get out and begin to talk, it is very difficult for them to realize. We didn't realize it at first that they actually wanted to do it. They are told they will never get out, no one will ever believe them, and that there is no freedom, that the law will get you. They are hopeless before they get someone willing to listen. They are threatened with death. Every time a child is killed in their group, they are told, you tell and this will happen to you. They have every reason to believe that. So even when they are into the foster care system and with another family and begin to feel somewhat safe, they still expect these people to show up on their doorstep. They believe that these people know everything they are doing, everyone they're talking to. One teenager told me that she had been told that if she ever got married that they would fool her. It would be one of them and she wouldn't know it ahead of time. They set them up to fail in every area. It is very prevalent in the Midwest, Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri, some people have speculated recently that these states are headquarters. As you listen to us talk about these things, there will be a natural part of you which will deny much of what you hear. And believe me, we did too. I would like to share this with you, partly in the children's words, so that you can hear the things that they said that nobody could make up, that no child could know. That's what eventually convinced me, along with the deep emotion the grieving, screeching damage and hurt that they cry out with as they talk. The children I will be talking about, these are all children that I personally talk to. They are today between the ages of 5 and 17. 
When they talked, they were between the ages of 5 and 15. When these things occurred to them, they were between the ages of, well, birth, but of when memory enters in. I would say a year and a half to eight. So we are talking about very small children. We are talking about children forming consciousness at that time, learning right from wrong. These children do not know. They come out and do not know what is right. They are confused. What they did before that they were rewarded for is such a horror to anybody else that they are shunned. And most often they have been in multiple placements. They will go to a home. They will steal. They will lie. They will hurt animals. One little guy would sharpen pencils and try to stab people. I don't mean poke. I mean stab. People don't like that in their homes. They don't have any idea what it is. They just think, we have a weird kid. Many are sent to psychiatric hospitals where they are labeled psychotics, schizophrenics. And who would want them in? I praise God that he brought so many of them into my life and through our home and that they were. there are other families like ours. It is just a movement of the Holy Spirit and the only way I can explain it. I will begin with the first stories that we heard which will seem horrible to you but are very mild to me because we have progressed and heard far worse things. The first story is about two little boys who were seven and nine when they talked and they told about sexual abuse at one point and were very grieved. We talked about good and bad touching and we thought we really had gotten to the bottom of it. And then that afternoon, the little one began to cry, and when we couldn't get the answer from him, the older brother said, he is probably crying because he was in the room when they killed his friend. That was the first one we know about. And as they described that they talked about that particular victim being brought into a room, hands and arms tied, mouth taped, and how there had been X's marked on his body, on his vital organs, that was bad enough within a very few weeks we learned that it was not the adults who had killed that child it was this oldest boy who was talking the next person that we talked to was a little boy who was very borderline mentally he had language problems and it was very hard for him to explain himself and when he began to come out of it everyone was startled the way he talked we were sh real sure we knew that he had been around these other children and heard things, but we began to question ourselves. Are we asking strange questions? Is there something odd about us which makes children come and dump things, things on? The part which made me believe this child's story, he talked about different babies being killed, but this particular one being stabbed. He curled up in a fetal position. He was nine years old when he was telling the story. He curled up in a fetal position and his eyes got real glazed. And he said, quote, they cooked that baby on the grill, end quote. And I thought he has really flipped out. I mean, I didn't know. And he said, quote, oh, gross, it smelled like rotten chicken or rotten deer, end quote. He then went on to tell us how they would cut out the heart or cut off the sex organs and save them in the refrigerator. A very typical thing that these kids talked about. They worshipped the sex organs. They kept it for another ceremony. I asked him where the bodies went. I did not get any answers from that child about what happened to the bodies. But the other two boys who I spoke about first, eventually they talked about throwing the babies in the fire. And I asked about that. You mean they were dead when they threw them in the fire? And the littlest one said, no, no. Them was alive and them threw them. And by this time, we were really getting freaked out. What were we going to do? How can you help these kids? Where do you find a therapist who can deal with this? But God set us up a support system. Other families were helping us, and that really helped. The next child I will share about, and I'm going sort of by categories here, how we learned and the types of killings the little girl is 11 today. She was nine when she first talked. It was a very painful thing when she first started to share the sex things. The sex things are so harmful to the children and they are so embarrassed 
And it's so personal to the children, and they know that they enjoyed that. They know that we had been through all that. She began to draw pictures of cats, and the cats all had tails that were on the other side of the page, or their leg was someplace else. As we began to work with her and talk, she said that she had had to kill a pregnant cat. She first said that they had killed a pregnant cat. We said, how did you know it was pregnant? Well, she could not explain that, but as we got into it, she confessed that she had had to kill the cat. And I asked her, and her description was, with a knife, I put it into her bottom and twisted. Now you tell me, does a kid know that? If I ask a kid, how do you kill a cat, do you think they will say that? Those are the kinds of details these children tell us. Later, and they eventually cut the cat open, and that was how they knew the cat was pregnant. And they eat parts of the cat and the feces and the blood. And again, this was just the beginning. It progressed, and the next time she had to kill a baby, the same way, put the knife in the bottom and twist. The baby was alive and he was screaming and that child hears that to this day and has nightmares and flashbacks and they cut the baby open and they ate the baby. They do this so there are no bodies left and they burn what is left and grind up the bones and she talked about pouring gasoline on the bodies and burning them in the backyard and I used to think that was nuts but I have heard it enough times now that I know it must be so. We know there are mortuaries involved to cremate the bodies, and that makes sense. The most horrible story about fire that I have to tell, and this is extremely, extremely disturbing, it was a little girl. She was a teenager when she was telling me, and she was describing a barn where they used to go to have their meetings, and they used to gather outside the barn, and there would be chanting. And then as they went inside the barn, they would be split into different groups. And she was never with any of her family. They all went to different places. And I asked her where she had to go, and she said, I was always in the burning room. And as she went on to describe the burning room, I thought, how she came out of this with any sanity at all? I don't know. She was a very small child. They would take in children, probably preschoolers, and they would hang them from the rafters in this barn. And there would be as many as five or ten hung in a row. They would be fully clothed, which is unusual because frequently they are naked. The children like this girl were all given candles. And you can picture the ceremony as she described it. And the candles were lit and then the adults would go forward and would pour liquid from a cup on each of the children's clothing, which was obviously gasoline or kerosene. And then they would give a signal and the others would have to go forward and set the children on fire. When they were done, they would cut them down. The first child that this girl had to kill was a cousin, a little cousin. What does that do to you? But you couldn't object because the children that objected were killed. Frequently, she said, people would come in Families not knowing that their child would be sacrificed. And she described the screams when they realized that their child had been killed. This child about two years ago just fell to the ground at Christmas time. Everyone thinks that Christmas is such a wonderful time. And she confessed that she hated Christmas. She couldn't wait until everything was put away because all she could hear was babies crying. Christmas is the time when the most babies die. And she covered up her ears and cried for two and a half hours and screamed, Stop it! Stop it! Stop it! Talk to God and make him stop it. All she could hear is the screams and the babies crying. Christmas for the children I have talked to has been one of the worst times. I have had three children tell me about a very similar ceremony. And I will kind of merge that and tell you how it went. They were taken to a church and all the children. It is a very festive occasion and they are taken to the front of the church. And a small child is now brought in. Two of them talked about babies and they put them on a platform. The adults are all celebrating and dancing and singing. And the children are getting into the 
spirit of it. And what they are doing is forming a circle around the child. And of course, the child represents the child Jesus. And they begin mocking and spitting and calling names. And then they encourage the children to begin doing it. And you can imagine how it gets out of control. And at some point, they hand all of the children knives and then they are all hacking and slashing until the baby is dead. And then they all celebrate because the child, Jesus, is dead. Kathleen Sorison was aware that it was dangerous to tell the public what she did. She appealed to friends to pray for her. She died in a head-on car accident in October of 1989. All right. That was a um, testimony from Kathleen Sorensen. Now I want to share one more testimony. It's from a Paul Bonacci, who is one of these children that came out and made these accusations uh, about the things that were happening to him and his friends. He was one of those that were fostered through the boys club and was taking around, uh, flown around to all these political parties and he actually has a um, picture, uh, uh, you know, like a uh, uh, picture-perfect memory to where he can remember every detail of everything. And he's able to relate it. And he wrote a diary during this particular time. And his diary was shared with John DeCamp, who wrote the Franklin cover-up. And in one of the accounts that he provides in his diary, it gives a testimony as to him and another boy being flown, Nicholas, being flown to a place outside of San Francisco that had large trees and how they were involved in ritualized abuse there. And we now know this place to be Bohemian Grove. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back, everybody, for... well. Will be final segment. I'm going to try to cover this last part as far as this information on Paul Bonacci and what I was talking about earlier before we went to break was that um, was that his eyewitness testimony is was one of the first accounts of Bohemian Grove and the ritual abuse that has been taken part there. Um, and this is at a time before suppo supposedly Alex Jones infiltrated, which I don't know if you believe that. I don't believe that. I, I believe that he was allowed to bring forth um, testimony as to what is going on there and that whole cremation of care mock ceremony uh, is just disinformation to let us believe that they are only doing mock rituals when according to this particular account that we're going to go into there's absolutely children being sacrificed there and that uh, there's a satanic occult element which is covering up the ritual abuse of these children and the things that they are being. And I, I want to also give a warning, a disclaimer, that the account that I'm going to be reading from is quite graphic. And that um, really it's it's going to be kind of... It's not for the faint of heart. And certainly if you have any children in... Um, in your particular that might be listening you you know they might not want to hear this particular part or segment of the show um oh goodness all right let me see if i can all right the account from paul bonacci and this is again from the franklin cobra this is the account from his diary. 
I went in January of 1984 on every trip. I was paid by men King knew for sex. In the summer of 1984, sometime I went to Dallas, Texas, and had sex with several men King knew in a hotel. I flew on YNR Airlines and Cam Airlines normally for King. I never had much personally to do with King, only went where he told me to go. In or on July 26th, I went to Sacramento. Now, notice the date here, too, uh, July 26th. I went to Sacramento, California. King flew me out on a private plane from Epley Airfield in Omaha to D Denver, where we pick up Nicholas, a boy who was about 12 or 13, and then we flew to Las Vegas to a desert strip and drove into Las Vegas and to some ranch and got something and then flew on to Sacramento. We were picked up by a white limo and taken to a hotel. I don't remember the name of it. We, meaning Nicholas and I, were driven to an area that had big trees. It took about an hour to get there. There was a cage with a boy in it who was not wearing anything. Nicholas and I were given these Tarzan things to put around us and stuff. They told me to F the boy and stuff. And at first I said no. And then they held a gun to my balls and said to do it or else lose them or something of that like. I began doing it to the boy and stuff. And Nicholas had anal sex and stuff with him and we were told to F him and stuff and beat on him and I didn't try to hurt him. We were told to put our D's in his mouth and stuff and sit on the boy's penis and stuff and then they filmed it. We did this stuff to the boy for about 30 minutes or an hour when a man came in and kicked us and stuff in the balls and picked us up and threw us. He grabbed the boy and started effing him and stuff, and then the man was about 10 inches long, and the boy screamed and stuff, and the man was forcing his D into the boy all the way, and the boy was bleeding from his rectum, and then the men tossed him and me and stuff and put the boy right next to me and grabbed a gun and blew the boy's head off. The boy's blood was all over me, and I started yelling and crying, and the men grabbed Nicholas and I, and forced us to lie down. They put the boy on top of Nicholas, who was crying, and they were putting Nicholas's hands on the boy's butt, and they put the boy on top of me and did the same thing. They then forced me to F the dead boy up his, and also Nicholas, and they put a gun to our heads to make us do it, and his blood was all over us. They made us kiss the boy's lips, and... Then they made me do something I don't even want to write, and so I won't. And after that, the men grabbed Nicholas and drug him off screaming, and they put me up against a tree and put a gun to my head but fired into the air. I heard another shot from somewhere, and then I saw the man who killed the boy drag him like a toy. Everything, including when the men put the boy in a trunk, was filmed. Then they took me with them, and we went up in a plane. I saw the bag the boy was in. We went over a very thick brush area with a clearing in it, and over the clearing they dropped the boy. One said, one said the men with the hoods would take care of the body for them. The men with the hoods would take care of the body for them. I didn't see Nicholas until that night at the hotel. He and I hugged and held each other. For a long while, about two hours later, the men, or Larry King, came in and told us to go take a shower since we had only been hosed off at some guy's house. We took a shower together and then were told to put on the Tarzan things. After we cleaned up and dressed in these things, we were told to put on shorts, socks, and a shirt and shoes and driven to a house where the men were at and with some others. They had the film and they played it. As the men watched, they passed Nicholas and I around as if we were toys and sexually abused us. They made Nicholas and I screw each other, and one of the men put the dead boy's D in mine and Nicholas's mouth, and I didn't want to write this because the man forced me to bite the boy's uh, penis and... and uh, that's just... 
it's just terrible. It was gross, and I saw the film where it happened and started freaking out, remembering what they made us do afterwards to the boy. They showed us doing everything to the boy. I was there for about five days, attending parties, but only recall cutting my wrist, which is why I stayed two days in a hospital under a name I can't recall. Some guy paid for me. All right, well, anyways... That is the testimony from Paul Bonacci, and you can see how it's graphic and it's um, it's it's horrific in nature. Uh, but they were talking about the satanic group, the men with hoods, the large area outside of San Francisco with the large trees, which we know that to be Bohemian Grove, um, and that all of this was filmed so-called by Hunter Thompson, who during the events of 9-11 afterwards, uh, he was suicided for um, it, coming out in interview and talking about the elites and their connection to it. But anyways, so I just wanted to share those three eyewitness stories from the Franklin cover-up in order to let you know, even at early 80s, this kind of stuff was going on. And I did post a link in the chat room also to a, a two-hour interview. Um, a two-hour interview in the from a YouTube video of a woman that was ritually abused by her family, her grandfather, her grandmother. I mean, her grandfather, her uncles, even her father and her mother. Um comment i i apologize brother i i mean it it's very horrific but again it's it's something that i wanted to share with you in order that you would understand that uh that these kids had a connection to bohemian grove and that this kind of stuff is going on and that even before we even knew about bohemian grove it was in his diary and that there was a link to what was going on and to the ritual abuse, the murder. The, you know, because we know the elites gathered there at Bohemian Grove. And if these boys were taken there, we, you can pretty much guess that they were passed around by some of these high rollers. Um, because only the high rollers get into Bohemian Grove. And so anyways, and also the Franklin cover-up. Um, points the finger at George H.W. Bush uh, and to others that were high political figures and the Republican and Democratic Party, um, you know, and that were also entrepreneurs, uh, very wealthy individuals. All right, and so I want to let me go ahead and read some of the other stories that are talking about this ninth circuit satanic cult other witnesses described their personal knowledge of efforts by defendants to conceal the involvement um, these killings spanned over 70 years and include the period between 1942 and 1945 when exiled Dutch queen Wilhelmina and her family lived in Canada and participated in ninth circle rituals at the Mohawk Indian school Introduced documentation indicates that to assist and conceal such involvement of Dutch royals in these cult killings, the Canadian government and Privy Council Office in London granted extraterritorial exemption to the Dutch royals from all criminal, civil, and military jurisdiction while in Canada. Dutch and Belgian royal participations, participants in the rape and killing of Mohawk children and newborns included Bilderberger founder, Crown Prince Bernard and King Hendrik, consort to Queen Wilhelmia of Holland. As part of the prosecutor's corroborating evidence, secret archives from the Jesuit order were introduced into the court record that described in detail the so-called magisterial privilege compelling the participation of every new pope in the Ninth Circle sacrifice of newborn children. The records suggest that the Ninth Circle was established by the Jesuits just prior to their staged 
disbandment in 1773 and their establishment three years later of the so-called Illuminati, Illuminati cult. Also references are also made to organize child sacrifice rituals at Catholic cathedrals in Rome as early as the year 1528. These archives clearly indicate a premeditated plan for centuries by the Jesuits to ritually murder, kidnap newborn babies, and then consume their blood, born of a twisted notion of deriving spiritual power from the lifeblood of the innocent and thereby assuring the political stability of the papacy in Rome. Every pope was expected to and did in fact participate in these monstrous rituals. These acts are not only genocidal, but systemic and institutionalized in nature and indict the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits as a whole and every pope since at least the year 1773. The same collection of Jesuit archival records make references to a child sacrificial cult known as the Knights of Darkness, established by the Nazi Waffen SS division in 1933 with Jesuit backing. The archives identify former Pope Benedict Joseph Ratzinger as a member of the Knights and as an arm uh, SS chaplain assistance at the Ravensbrück concentration camp in Germany, where he participated in sacrificial rites using children transported to the camp or kidnapped from political prisoners. The latter practice was a common Jesuit undertaking in Spain, Argentina, and other fascist regimes, and one implicating chief defendant Jorge Borgoglio, Pope Francis, while he was a priest, bishop, and frontman for the military junta in Argentina during the 1970s. ITCCS Field Secretary Kevin Annette is scheduled to appear as a witness during the second session of the court Commencing Monday, May 5th, Annette will pro provide thorough corroborating evidence and personal testimony to support the prosecutor's case and the evidence concerning the Brantford killings gained over 20 years' work with residential school survivors in Canada, including during his targeted persecution by church and state. Meanwhile, in startling related news, a senior Vatican official initiated a back-channel communication with the court last week in order to offer key evidence to the prosecutor's office concerning its case against the chief defendants. The Vatican official has requested strict anonymity, anonymity and security, prompting the court magistrates to consider extending the closed sessions of the court during its next round in May. Finally, uh, I read about that, how they were going to do that. Okay. Now, I want to read something else. Um, this is talking about how they were hunting kids down in, in, in like a human hunt. It's crazy. And also about the mass graves. So I'm going to read these two real quick. Decapitated, dismembered children in Catholic mass grave site were ritually murdered. By Judy Bington. All right, hold on. Marks on the bones of nearly 800 children found in a Roman Catholic nun septic tank indicated they had been ritually killed, a source within the Irish Garda police force revealed this week. The, the informant told five judges of the International Common Law Court of Justice in Brussels that forensic experts have confirmed the decapitation and dismemberment of babies in the mass grave resembled the usual signs of ritualistic murder. Last week, death certificates were released on the 796 Irish children ages two months to nine years found in a cistern at the Catholic St. Mary Mother's and Baby's Home near Tom. The forensic evidence appeared to link the children's death to the global elite Ninth Circle Satanic Child Sacrifice Cult Network, 
Since last month, Roman Catholic and Irish government officials have been named by witnesses at the ICLCG court as members of the Ninth Circle Satanic Child Sacrifice Cult. These children weren't just cut up, they were massacred, the policeman from the Irish Garda told the court. Yesterday, the Irish government and Roman Catholic Church may have commenced a cover-up by closing off the child mass grave site and announcing their own in-house investigation. That is the standard procedure in any institutional cover-up. All right. Um, there was a comment about how, I, I believe it was comment that spoke about how he didn't think any of these individuals would be brought to justice. And whether that's true or not, the fact is that at least the information is coming out. We know that, you know, justice is just us, meaning the elites, for those who can afford justice and that can buy it or with power and persuasion um, overthrow what would be the rule of law. All right, I want to get to the other one real quick. Uh, European royals killing naked children for fun at human hunting parties. Okay, I'm going to skip, skip the opening and get to, get to the main portion of the article. Teens were drugged, stripped naked, raped, and hunted down in the woods and killed by European royals, according to this week's latest eyewitness, to testify before the International Common Law Court of Justice in Brussels. The woman was the fourth eyewitness to give accounts about these human hunting parties of the global elite Nine Circle Satanic Child Sacrifice Cult Network. A former member of the Netherlands criminal drug syndicate known as Octopus testify that the victims were obtained for these human hunting parties from juvenile detention centers in Belgium and Holland. In 2000, quote, in 2004, I was an involuntary witness to torture, rape, and murder sessions of drug children performed for a group of high-ranked people of the Netherlands, end quote, stated a woman, quote, I was taken to a hunting party in Belgium close to Brussels, where I saw two boys and a girl ages four to 14 to 16 hunted and killed by global elites. The human hunting party was heavily guarded by the Netherlands Royal Guards. I was told that King Albert of Belgium was present, end quote. Four eyewitnesses confirmed that as children in use, they were forced to attend human hunting parties where they and other children were raped with some killed and deceased boys Penises were then cut off. Allegedly, there was a Dutch countryside palace where boys' penises were displayed like trophies on a wall. Some hunting parties were hosted on the grounds of Belgium Queen Beatrice's palace. Dutch therapist Toos Nijenhuis claimed that as four-year-old, she was forced to witness murder of children that involved former Pope Ratzinger, a Dutch Catholic cardinal plus the father of Netherlands, Belgium Queen Beatrix and Bilderberg founder Dutch Crown Prince Alfred Nick Bernhard. Quote, I saw the former Pope Ratzinger murder a little girl. End quote. Another witness confirmed, quote, it was at a French chateau in the fall of 1987. It was ugly, horrible, and didn't happen just once. Ratzinger and Bernard were some of the more prominent men who took part. In Ireland, Spain, and Canada, 34 child mass grave sites were discovered and appeared linked to this Ninth Circle satanic cult and their activities. The largest was the Mohawk Indian Residential School in Brantford, Ontario, where child remains were identified in 2008 before the Catholic Church, Canadian government, and English Crown shut down the dig by professional archaeologists. Uh, the 2013 court have found Queen Elizabeth and Prince Philip guilty for the October 10th, 1964 disappearance of 10 native children from the Catholic Residential School. All right, we'll pick this up next week where we have Kevin Annette join us for eyewitness testimony on this case. God bless all. Good night.